Hi, I'm the Octopus Lady, you're watching Alien Ocean, and let's talk about dinoflagellates again today, shall we? Which are what causes this, to answer the question in the video title. Also, yeah, we kind of beefed up the glow for the thumbnail, because, you know, gotta make thumbnails clickable or whatever. Anyway, this is part two of two on our little series about these creatures. But to recap, dinoflagellates are a type of plankton. They all look super different from each other. Their taxonomy is a mess. They've probably been around for at least 200 million years-ish, probably. They have absurd amounts of DNA. They can live in so many different places. They're BFFs with corals and their friendship is so strong that corals kind of die without them. And they are one of the many types of plankton that can cause halves or harmful algal blooms, which are also sometimes called red tides. Did this recap go too quick for you? Keep up, I move fast. Or you can just watch my last video. It's all right, I can wait. Here, I'll even put up a little thing so that the rest of the audience knows that, yeah, yeah, off you go then, get all caught up. Okay, so at the end of the last video, I was talking about how there are two different ways that Habs put the ha in harmful? The first is through uncontrolled growth, and the other is just by being very toxic, and a lot of toxic halves are caused by dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates are quite fond of neurotoxins, which are strong enough to kill birds, marine mammals, and us too. And the most common vector of these poisons is through shellfish. Most shellfish are filter feeders, so as they are filtering the water for food, these toxic dinoflagellates accumulate inside of them, and then we eat them. Or a bird eats them, or an otter eats them, and then we die. Well, we don't always die. Sometimes we could just get really sick. But these neurotoxins are so potent that it doesn't take much to kill. Us. The toxin saxitoxin produced by dinoflagellates like alexandrium and gymnodinium is 1,000 times more potent than cyanide. A pinhead size quantity about 500 micrograms can easily kill you, and that amount can accumulate in about 100 grams of shellfish, no problem. The different toxins produced by different dinoflagellates results in different kinds of poisonings. For example, saxitoxin results in paralytic shellfish poisoning. And in case you couldn't tell from the name, if you get a bad case of PSP, you become paralyzed. Your whole body locks up, including your diaphragm and you suffocate to death. There's another toxin produced by the dinoflagellate dinophysis that causes diuretic shellfish poisoning, and you can probably gather on your own what kind of symptoms you experience there. The dinoflagellate karenia produces toxins that results in neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, and a bad case of that can, oh, alter your perception of hot and cold. That's interesting. What a trip. Oh, but it can also cause difficulty breathing and trouble with talking and swallowing. Hmm. Finally, there's ciguatera fish poisoning caused by the dinoflagellate gambier discus, and symptoms include numbness and tingling of hands and feet, decreased heart rate and blood pressure, difficulty balancing, and death through respiratory failure. But if you don't die, you might suffer from these neurological symptoms for months or even years after you've been poisoned. So that's fun. And look, don't freak out if you eat a lot of shellfish. You're probably not going to get poisoned if you eat commercially grown shellfish because they're constantly being tested for biotoxins. But if you go out and harvest your own shellfish, I'm not going to make any recommendations on how to do that more safely because I don't want to get sued. I do want to say though, in defense of dinoflagellates and algae in general, that of the 2,500 known species of dinoflagellates, only about 100 of them produce dangerous toxins. And algae blooms, even when there's a lot of algae, aren't all harmful. And in fact, algae blooms are super important to the ocean ecosystem as a whole, as the phytoplankton that makes up these blooms are a massive food source to marine animals, and without them, the entire ocean food web would collapse. It would not be unlike if the majority of plants on land suddenly were removed from this plane of existence. We would be in a lot of trouble, right? So dinoflagellates and algae blooms are overall a good thing, and without dinoflagellate algae blooms in particular, we wouldn't have this. This isn't fake, this isn't edited, there are no special effects here. Under the correct conditions, dinoflagellates can produce light. Bioluminescence, the production and emission of light by a living organism. A surprising number of organisms are capable of this. Fireflies are probably the most famous ones. There are fungi, there are deep sea fangly fish, and there are dinoflagellates. Not all dinoflagellates are bioluminescent. The majority of them, I believe, are not. But man, imagine if they all were. How wild would coral reefs look? But anyway, this is a bioluminescent and dinoflagellate. And side note, this is my favorite species of dinoflagellate, which I didn't know I had until I started making this video, but this is Noctiluca. And I adore her because she has such a pretty name that basically translates to nightlight. But side note to the side note, Pyrocystis lunula and Neoceratium fusis? Neoceratium fusis? 
whatever, are pretty close seconds because, oh my god, why is she shaped like a crescent moon? She is so beautiful. And look at this long boy. Look at him! He's so long! I love him so much. He looks like Peabody from Portal 2. Oh, and side note to the side note to the side note, if you've seen The Shape of Water or my video about it, you can clearly see where they got inspiration for the fish man's sparkly skin. How bioluminescence works in dinoflagellates involves the chemical luciferin, the enzyme luciferase, and sometimes the protein luciferin binding the luciferin binding protein. When luciferin binds to luciferase, it releases a flash of blue light, which is how we get oceans that look like this. To make sure that these two things aren't binding to each other randomly and flashing willy-nilly, some dinoflagellates use the luciferin binding protein to keep luciferin from reacting with luciferase. All these names sound really similar to each other, so hopefully this isn't too confusing. The reason why the light is blue and not, say, white or red or chartreuse is because blue light, particularly blue light with a wavelength between 474 and 476 nanometers, can be seen from fairly far distances in water, which led scientists to believe that the point of dinoflagellate bioluminescence had something to do with the fact that these little creatures were trying to communicate something. Some researchers believe that the reason dinoflagellates are bioluminescent is because the flash of light scares off potential predators. However, this wasn't an entirely satisfying answer, as others pointed out that, in theory, predators would eventually get used to the flashing light. Some researchers thought it was a warning sign of being poisonous, as a lot of dinoflagellates that are bioluminescent are also very toxic, but then other scientists were like, well then why are there non-toxic dinoflagellates that are bioluminescent? Uh, it could suggest the existence of a model mimicry system like Batesian mimicry, which is a form of biological resemblance in which a noxious or dangerous organism, the model, equipped with a warning system such as conspicuous coloration, is mimicked by a harmless organism, the mimic. The mimic gains protection because predators mistake it for the model and leave it alone. I I know what Batesian mimicry is. Why are you explaining it to me like that? Mm, no. We just did some experiments. Their predators are immune to their toxins, so that's not a solid reason. It was actually all the way back in 1943 that a scientist suggested the burglar alarm hypothesis, which hypothesizes that bioluminescence in dinoflagellates is not for scaring off predators, but for attracting the attention of the predators of the predator. Or in other words, when threatened by, say, a copepod, dinoflagellates light them up with a neon sign that flashes, free lunch, free lunch. And indeed, a study done in the early 90s showed that when copepods and fish that eat copepods were placed in jars with bioluminescent and non-bioluminescent dinoflagellates, the fish ate way more copepods in this jar compared to this jar. And these fish had never been exposed to bioluminescence before, so it's not like this was something evolutionarily hardwired into their DNA or whatever. There was also a study done in 2019 where copepods were fed dinoflagellates that were bioluminescentine and ones that were switch off, and the copepod actively kicked away the glowing dinoflagellates. <laughs> Just like, no, 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 get those away from me. As noted in the paper from the 1990s, it's important to remember that the burglar alarm hypothesis is likely not the sole reason for the existence of bioluminescence in dinoflagellates. It could be all of these things, or maybe some of these things, or maybe for reasons we don't totally understand yet, but studies show that the burglar alarm hypothesis is definitely a reason, but not the reason. But all this reminds me of a funny story I read in this book. It's believed that the first recorded death from paralytic shellfish poisoning was in 1793, when English colonizer George Vancouver and his crew landed in British Columbia and decided to chow down on some shellfish. But the local indigenous tribes were like, I wouldn't eat those if I were you. And George and his crew were like, why not? Well, when the ocean waters glow, that means it's unsafe to eat shellfish. <laughs> What do you people know? Uh, a lot, actually. We've been living here for a really long time, and we're basically the only folks who have any knowledge about how stuff works around here, and oh, they're dead. You know, it was weird. I already knew all this stuff about dinoflagellates. Like, I knew that dinoflagellates had a ton of DNA, and that they were the zooxanthellae inside of corals, and they produced very toxic poisons, and they were capable of bioluminescence, but it wasn't until I made this video that I realized that, wow, all of this is done by one type of plankton. Most of the other organisms I've talked about on my channel so far can only do like one or two cool things. Like you only got two sets of jaws and you can only throw up all your guts and you don't even really do anything. We just harvest your blood. But dinoflagellates are without question the most multifaceted organism I've ever had the pleasure to make videos about. Thanks for watching another episode of Alien Ocean. Today's hopefully interesting question to the audience, so they leave comments and boost engagement, is if you could produce your own poison, what kind of symptoms would you want people to experience when exposed to said poison? You can go with classic poisoning symptoms like death, or you can do something fun, like maybe people who ingest your poison, uh, I don't know, become very good at color theory. 
Anyway, leave a comment down in the comments with your answer. I know that if people ingested the poison I created, it would make them subscribe to my channel and sign up for my Patreon, where they would get early access to my videos and their name in the credits. And hit that like button. One like is equal to one bioluminescent algae bloom that you will get to see in your lifetime. I don't care if you live out in the middle of nowhere. If you smash that like button, some beautiful glowing dinoflagellates will definitely appear one day. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood octopus lady reminding you that you don't need to go into space to find aliens.